uh, and uh, increase it up upwards. I think it'll be all right. 74 will be a little more comfortable than maybe with some. We've been having a real time adjusting the temperature of the congregation here recently. And um, most of the complaints I get is cold. <laughs> cold. It's just cold. So we want to do what we can to change that and make it more comfortable if we can find the way to do that. Um, and um, all right, let's, we're, we're going to pray tonight for Sister Judy Schock. Uh, she's still in the hospital. Uh, Sister Wanda Schoen went home. Brother uh, Pete Farias took her home this evening. But Sister Judy will be there for a few days, I think, yet. And um, we want to remember Sister Judy in prayer tonight and ask the Lord to help her. Um, there are others that uh, need, in need of prayer, and that would be probably quite a, quite a group. Brother Ernest Harvey is um, not feeling well, and I'm a little concerned about him. He's not usually sick, but he's um, been um, ill the last few days, off and on. So let's remember Brother Ernest and uh, Sister Judy. And um, there's others, I'm sure, that are in need. My mind is just not clicking in right now to um, bring them to the uh, request area. But I, I believe we know that there's a number of people that need prayer. And we'll just keep praying for them and asking God to, to help them uh, and uh, pray that the Lord will overshadow us the Bob here, let's keep remember the Bob Sellers and Patty in prayer, uh, that their health will improve and they'll they'll be able to uh, they want to be very active and desire to be very active in the church to carry a great burden, responsibility in the church, and let's pray that God will strengthen their bodies, and make miracles happen and come come to pass in their life. Um, we uh, we want to uh, pray for the church that God, Sister Candy Kieran has not been well here recently, and uh, we really want to hold her up in prayer. Um, we um, all of us pray for the nation, of course, but pray for our church as well. The, the influenza outbreak—it's the worst in a decade in this country, uh, that they're saying it's the worst outbreak of the old common flu. And uh, I think as of now, over 2,000 people have been hospitalized with it. 18 have lost their lives with it. And uh, it's quite an epidemic uh, now developing in 41 states. So let's pray that God will overshadow us and keep us and uh, we'll try to practice all the manners we can of uh, if a cough develops uh, muffle it with a handkerchief or something and uh, turn your face away and uh, uh, wash the hands after contact with a, a group or in, you know going through in a day do all the things we can in hygiene to Ward off this this uh, epidemic that's coming across our country. We pray that none of the saints will be afflicted with it. All right. Any other request? Any other special request for prayer tonight? Um, Carol Nelson, Dr. Nelson's wife. She's still in the hospital. Brother really Bill Daniels. He was with us yesterday, but I felt so. So touched by Brother Bill, he sat down on the platform with me, and I said, "Brother Bill, it's good to see you." And he said, uh, "Brother John, is that you?" Of course, he's known me since I was a boy, lifelong friends. He said, uh, "Tell me again, and you'll, you you may not you, I may not know you in a few minutes. You may not know who you are." 
And uh, that's sad, isn't it? It is. That's yes, very it sad. Is. That uh, that kind of affliction would be in a man's life, a businessman who's dealt in millions of dollars, millions, and is in that condition. Let's remember Bill Daniels. Uh, God will help him. All right. There's other. If there's not other needs, other requests. Yes. I two persons, Sister Digna Munoz, which is Sister Tanya's mother. She had to go to the doctor today. They find a hole in the heart. She's not young. No. So she's very concerned. Yes. When they find what's wrong with her heart, they find a hole in her heart. Mm -hmm. And Sister Natty, too, as you know, she's getting really bad down. But she's been having problems with one of her heads. And today she was going to go for x rays for MRI. Two sisters in the bilingual part of the church that really needs uh, prayer. And uh, we just want to hold them before God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Continue to pray for the church. <coughs> pray for the grounds. Pray for the ministry. Pray for the leadership of the Holy Ghost. And uh, let's walk close with God. Do what we can to help each other. And here on the grounds, everybody look out for one another. You know, we have around uh, 60 people now living on the grounds. And uh, don't, don't be isolated uh, if you need help. Uh, call out and let, let someone know here on the grounds that you need help, that you need um, mm -hmm. fellowship, you need perhaps comfort, strength. Whatever it would be, uh, well, let's be a family here on the grounds, and um, as well as in the church, and then uh, let uh, elders know. I want to let you all know that Don Langford is working now uh, several days out of the week here on the grounds with us, and uh, he's uh, one of our pastors, he's one of our elders. John Stewart's on the grounds. He's Lee Wallace is on the grounds here. Uh, the elders of the church that are here on the grounds, and with Bob Sellers get his health back, uh, be active in that field. But there's there's men here that can uh, help. They can pray. They can counsel. And so let's uh, watch after one another. And Steve Cruiser is here on the grounds. And we want to uh, have with Rick, who lives on the grounds. These are elders of the church. And we want to uh, want you to know that they're here. Brother Langford has uh, been spoken to by the Lord to take a very active and uh, stronger role here in uh, helping the church. And I'm uh, very thankful. That he's been with me a long, long time since he was a young man, and has been very faithful as these other brethren have been. And I appreciate every one of them, not one without exception. Everyone. So we're going to pray. <laughs> that that alerted everybody, didn't it? I think we need to pray for that. Whatever that was. <laughs> Electronic, I know that. <laughs> unless, unless God Himself <laughs> sent out a sound. All right, we're going to pray. That was a trumpet blow. The trumpet blew, didn't it? It really did. The power and force of amplification. Father, we want to thank you. We come right now and we close our minds in and we pray. shut out everything, everything around us. We just push it out. We push it back. We don't want to even be bothered the next hour, the next time that we're studying here, but with any oppression or fear or doubt, we don't want any weariness to be over us or to intervene 
We're trying to learn your word. Learn what thus saith the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord speaking and the word being spoken through the Holy Ghost. Uh, let our hearts be clear. Let it be strengthened in the Lord. And of all these things that we speak about, that the weakness that people have in their bodies and affliction, we just pray for them. We just pray for them. Uh, we, we call upon you, Lord, while you're near. We seek you while you may be found, that you would intervene, intervene. Intervene, come into the life, come into the life, into the individual hearts. Oh God, let us be unified in one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one calling, hope. All of these things, Lord, let it be that the power of God and the Holy Spirit will rest over us tonight and sanctify the grounds anew. Sanctify the Bible lesson anew. Sanctify every word we're going to say. And Lord, our internet family that's looking in, will be looking in on YouTube and uh, on any medium. Lord, we pray for you out across the known world, wherever you may be listening, or uh, the Spirit of God directs your mind, your attention to this teaching tonight of the Word. We love you, Lord. We ask your forgiveness. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. It's you that's worthy. We're nothing, but you're everything. We have nothing to be exalted about except that you live in us and we exalt you, Lord. We exalt you. If there be conditions that are just so bad and they're just working on someone so badly till it's bringing discouragement and weariness, whether they're in this group tonight or whether they're in the church, or whether they're in the body, oh God, look upon them with tenderness and kindness. Lord, as we go into this year, stir people, stir them, Lord. Stir them to come out. Stir them to hear the word. Stir them to be in worship. Stir them to be in teaching, Lord. Prepare them. Get them ready. Talk to their hearts. Oh, God. Oh, God, talk to their hearts. You can do it. You can make people aware of a Bible teaching on Monday night. You can make them aware of a worship, the bilingual ministry on Tuesday nights. You can make them aware, Lord, of meetings held for instruction, training, right on through the calendar week we live in. You're our God. You're our Savior. You're our Lord. And tonight we just draw ourselves up and say, Lord, we want to praise you, worship you, and study your word. We humble ourselves before the great, mighty, awesome God that you are. We don't doubt you. We don't live, Lord, in doubt. We know you're God. You're the Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Praise your name. Praise your name. Oh, Jesus, remember your people tonight. Wherever they are, remember your ministry. The Lord knoweth them that are his. You know those that are yours tonight, Lord. Let's be merciful. Show mercy. Show forgiveness. Oh, God. Oh God, we thank you for this Bible study group tonight. Thank you for them coming. Thank you for their desire. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Bible is such a wonderful book that I, I don't think anybody would hunger. And that's really the only ones that are ever filled is the hungry. Um, if you're not hungry, of course, you wouldn't desire. Um, the scripture said in Solomon's Proverbs, to every hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Um, but a full soul will loathe even a honeycomb. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't matter how sweet that God's word may be, and I would think it would be sweet, and believe it is, <coughs> if I'm full of self, or full of my own interpretation, or full of um, desire to do something else besides spend my time in some study, I won't receive because I'm not hungry. I'm just not hungry enough to receive it. Um, but I, I thank God tonight that my soul, uh, and then he said, the hungry he thought of good things, but the rich he turns empty away. Uh, I'm not rich. The rich young ruler could not subject himself to Christ, though he kept the commandments from his youth up. But he just failed the final test, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He failed the final test. Jesus said, well, if you've done these things, then go and sell mm -hmm. all that you have and come and follow me. And the rich young ruler who seemed to be so righteous and so very good, uh, looked like the epitome of righteousness, uh, but it was self-righteousness and did not allude to the righteousness of God. Uh, it, uh, I love the way that Paul, uh, over in Romans, look at the way he uses that to show us that our righteousness can um, not please God and uh, that is our right way of doing things. Our I, Romans 10, I believe, uh, but um, it, it's not our righteousness that pleases God. Uh, it's His righteousness. Brethren, verse 1, Paul said, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. They might be saved. He was an Israelite, so Paul, uh, as Moses, uh, could not stand to see the Egyptian uh, giving the Hebrews slaves a hard time, and he struck out and killed the man, killed the Egyptian, very, and uh, it ended Moses being a prince in the house of uh, Pharaoh's daughter. He no longer was a prince because he became a criminal, a murderer. And um, uh, that's an interesting thought on does God uh, have forgiveness for even a murderer? He did with Moses. Moses took a man's life and God forgave him. Now, that might be because Moses was destined, predestined, to be uh, the leader of Israel to lead them out. But here regardless, that's in one instance in the scriptures uh, where that, um, that if God forgave such a heinous crime as murder. And um, I know the New Testament tells us uh, that I believe the Apostle John said that no murderer had the eternal life abiding in him. Um, well, that's uh, true that that scripture would have to be referred to as well as the scripture I used concerning Moses. I'm just not going to stay on this subject. Just give you a thought, scattering thought for your mind uh, to uh, think about um, Moses.
Moses did not have eternal life. So it's possible that in the category of resurrection, no murderer could obtain the first resurrection, but there where but very well could be forgiven enough to be in the resurrection of the justified that would live a so a terrestrial life, if not a celestial life. That's possible. Because, you know, we have these two comparisons and the Bible doesn't contradict itself. John said that uh, you know uh, no murder had the eternal life abiding in him. Another thing to consider in the context that John used that in, it was not dealing with physical life. John was using it in the context of hate that a brother would have for his brother. Hate. Hate is a terrible thing. Hate then is equal to being a murderer, isn't it? Uh, according to John. Uh, we know, he said, whosoever hated his brother's murder. That was his subject, hating your brother. And you know, he said, that no murder hath the eternal life abiding in him. So it's very, hate is a very strong element and cannot be in the category of a child of God. A child of God cannot hate um, if he hates anything other than evil, because hatred is such a strong emotion. It's such a strong emotion. And uh, so that's just some little thoughts I'm sprinkling out to you to consider. And if you uh, have questions on it later on, uh, you could ask. But look at Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. They, in other words, there's a possibility of them being saved. He said, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, that is, Israel does. Paul said, they have a zeal of God, but, but uh, not according to knowledge. All right. So they had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So you can have zeal without proper knowledge, can't you? And uh, God would judge you for having zeal, and he would say, what a zealous man that is, what a zealous woman that is, but if it were outside of knowledge, your zeal could get you in trouble, could get you into a problem area um, without knowledge, because knowledge is the headlights uh, called wisdom that pierces the darkness of the unknown and uh, causes you to make the right decisions concerning uh, what's up ahead of you, what which you're going into. And so uh, that's why the Bible said wisdom is the principal thing. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Uh, wisdom, wisdom. I've not seen, I'm not seeking this critically, but I have not seen wisdom play the greater part in the church in the years that I have been involved. I have seen, at times, utter lack of wisdom, utter, uh, utter uh, lack of understanding. Uh, and it's sad because the people of God should be people of wisdom. Uh, and, and it's not so prevalent among us as a collective body. That's why Jesus said uh, that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Because they have more wisdom practiced among them in the world than we do in light. Doesn't mean that God can, uh, condones them being in the world uh, because they'd be lost in the world. But it's just an example to show you uh, how that uh, Paul said uh, they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Um, knowledge is, is it beautifies. <coughs> knowledge sets in order. Knowledge corrects. Knowledge admonishes. 
uh, when knowledge is prevalent in a church where people, there's a, at least a good percentage of the people in that church, a good percentage of that ministry that is sitting in knowledge and then wisdom, you know, from knowledge. You can't have wisdom without having knowledge. Uh, knowledge is the two box full of facts, information. Wisdom is the ability to put the right handle on the proper wrench yes. and and sort and separate yes. the tubes in the toolbox. So you'll use the proper tube yes. for the job you're trying to do. That's wisdom. Uh, you, you have a box full of tubes, yes. a lot of knowledge, that have a lot of informed facts mm -hmm. in your in your toolbox. But if you don't have I, I, I be, of course, being a speaker through the years and most of my years in the church, I've been a speaker, and, and so I naturally listen keenly to men in the ministry and men coming up and men beginning ministry and women beginning ministry. Um, and uh, I, I listen keenly, and I can see many times where that they've got a box full of tools but they, don't, they, they have a difficult area in knowing, uh, instead of taking four tools out for one job, uh, just get the tool they need and slip it on there and, and get the Word of God across. Uh, say what the Holy Ghost would have them to say and let the people be blessed by it, benefited by it. Uh, so uh, Paul said, they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Well, let's see what goes with that now. Verse uh, 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. God's righteousness. Well, and that would be the way that God would look at anything versus the way I would look at anything. And then he would proclaim, this is right. And he would separate righteousness from ignorance or righteousness from lack of knowledge. But Paul said they they being ignorant of God's righteousness. They don't know what God wants. Israel does not know what God wants. The fifth chapter of Isaiah said they would call light darkness. Woe be unto them that call light darkness and darkness light, evil good, good evil sweet bitter and bittersweet. Woe be unto them uh, that does this. And and I've seen that in my lifetime, that they would call something sweet. It wasn't sweet at all by the word of God. It was bitter. And something good that wasn't good at all by God's word. It, it was evil. And, and, you know, something light, they, they call it, a, they, that is darkness, they would call it light, and it wasn't light, it was darkness. Um, so uh, that if I'm ignorant of God's righteousness, then I'll go about, and this is what Israel did, so they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness. I see. In other words, to prove the point they were right, Israel. They wanted to prove the point to Jesus. Three and a half years, uh, the four Gospels are full of the exchanges between Jesus and the Pharisee and the Sadducee uh, on what was right concerning the law. And he would uh, say, but your law said. And they would uh, try to catch him, lay wait, and catch his words <coughs> and entrap him, you know, uh, by, by, what are you going to do with this now? You know, here's a woman, we caught her in the very act of adultery. The iron law said that she should be stoned. They were zealous of the law, but they didn't, and Jesus didn't <coughs> combat that by his wisdom. And he, I never read an instance where Jesus was ever defeated by a Pharisee rabbi. I never read an instance in the scriptures where a, a, a Sadducee rabbi 
or use the law to entrap Christ. Uh, you know, uh, and and so you know they they just he came back at them and uh, would ask. And usually the method I noticed that Jesus used it's a good method in uh, dealing and teaching or receiving teaching. Jesus answered a question with a question. A, a good part of the time, and that's a, that's a good method of teaching. He answered a question with a question, uh, you know, and uh, he would get them to get, answer him, and uh, they said, like, they said, well, we can't, we can't tell, uh, you know, we can't answer that, because he would entrap them in their own words. So they were ignorant of God's righteousness, and they went about to establish their own righteousness, and um, they they have not, he said, in doing this, they have not submitted to the uh, righteousness of God. They've not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. And then he concludes it by saying, verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So Christ fulfilled the law and didn't destroy the law. He fulfilled it and he ended the law in righteousness. That was, the, he said, he said, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Uh, to everyone who believes. That, that just stopped it um, and said the law was fulfilled. Let's roll it up as a scroll. And they did. They rolled up the law as a scroll. The believers did of Christ. And uh, that covenant was done away with and replaced with a better covenant. So it's very important that we, we uh, strive to understand the scriptures, and yet at the same time, we don't become exalted in understanding those scriptures, but we strive for knowledge and seek knowledge. Um, uh, Second Peter, the first chapter, let's look at that. Yeah. Um, that's uh, good, and, and uh, that, that uh, expression I just used, um, because, you know, we, we strive to fulfill, um, get that second Peter, and adding to, adding to, uh, let's see, go to uh, second Peter and the first chapter and the third verse, according, according as his divine power had given unto us all things that is of God that pertain unto life and godliness. That's what divine power brings us. Through the knowledge that comes about, uh, this divine power enables us to have all things pertaining unto life, eternal life and godliness, godlikeness, the image of God. And we receive this through divine power, the work of the Holy Spirit. But it's through, while it's by the Holy Spirit, it's through the knowledge of Him who has called us to glory and virtue. It's through the knowledge of Christ, in other words, that we attain to life and godliness through divine power. Then in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great. Exceeding means beyond the norm, beyond the level that you were anticipating. And you were not anticipating that great of an inflow of knowledge, understanding, the gift of God in your life. But you, whereby are given unto us exceeding great, beyond the norm, and precious, they're precious, <coughs> promises. Promises would be from God, of course, 
that by mm -hmm. these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, you, you are able to pertain unto life and godliness through divine power, but now by promises of God, that's covenant, that's covenant, covenant. by the covenant. And um, I'm going to be saying more about the word covenant, I think, because I, I think that God wants the people that are going to uh, be steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord, to come more than they have to covenant. A covenant is an unbreakable agreement. And if you break it, you'll be penalized for it. You'll be judged for it. Um, see, it, it, I think a lot of people, it's so easy for them to break a promise, break a relationship that they have with one another or they have with God uh, because they don't feel that there's any judgment, there's any penalty if they do this. Uh, but, you know, it's much like an investment. We use the example of an investment in savings. You cannot take $500 and put it in a savings, a CD, or a thousand, whatever, um, in a bank. You make covenant with that bank. That, that's an 18-month CD. That's a 24-month CD. And they're, they're going to pay you, but you can't touch it. They're going to use your money, but you can't touch it. You covenant with that bank. You, there's an agreement written out that you sign when you take that <coughs> CD out, that savings plan. It's not just loose change anymore. You can buy a hamburger if you want to. Uh, it's locked in. It's locked up. It's a savings. Um, now, you can take it out, but you're going to pay through the nose, as the expression goes, if you remove that CD. And the quicker you remove it from the length of term it's to expire, the more they're going to get you for it. Yeah. Until it's quite heavy in the early stages, 30% uh, up to 30% or more in some CD plans, uh, you know. So you can't do it, Sister Lorraine. Isn't there the same thing on the second mortgage? The same thing, the same rules um, on the second mortgage. Now, it, see, that's banking laws. Uh, but but it, it also serves as an example for us. We have a covenant with Christ, or we should have realized we entered into covenant with him because his covenant is written in blood. His covenant is endowed with grace. Uh, Israel did not exist with God outside of a covenant. The reason that they sustained national life for 1,500 years was because of the covenant agreement in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, uh, Numbers, Judges, um, they, 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 there was a covenant there, but we don't, we don't really think about that uh, when we, as a whole, collectively, that when you rise up in Christ and you're washed in the blood and you're forgiven, that you entered into a covenant with Christ under the new covenant based on better promises, <coughs> and you just can't go in and abuse that covenant. No, sir. You just can't go in and withdraw one helping out of that after another. That's your savings. That's grace. Yeah. And there's much grace there. Savings. There's eternal life. You, but if you just violate it continually, and I need it, I got to draw 500 out. I got to draw 